to MGE Lunch and Learn and our Wildcast podcast. Um, Jeremy is a native of New York City, even though he is three hours behind. Uh, you're in Los Angeles now, I assume. I am not. I'm in uh, I'm in Syracuse, New York. Right oh, now. oh, I knew that actually, but I didn't know you were now. In I'm Syracuse. currently in Syracuse, New York. Um, I, uh, I'm, I'm in Syracuse, New York. I'm separated from, uh, from Sam. Uh, I'm, I'm with, I'm with, uh, we have two houses that we're, we're kind of currently living in because of the mm -hmm. COVID situation. Um, but we're, uh, we're, we're doing great. Thank God we're doing great. That's awesome. All right. So let me give a little introduction for those of you who are not familiar with Jeremy and Sam. So uh, Jeremy is originally from New York, and he is first and foremost a proud alumnus of the Manhattan Jewish Experience. Um, and yeah, before then he attended um, uh, Yale University, graduated with degrees in film and theater, and he made his name in Hollywood uh, when he helped write and produce the 2006 romantic comedy, The Breakup. You remember that movie, Vince Vaughn and Jennifer Aniston, love that film. And his writing credits also include The Hangover, the Wedding Ringer, which was a movie he also directed. He's done a ton of amazing creative things. And he's also an extraordinarily proud Jew um, and uh, very active in the Jewish community in Los Angeles. In 2020, Jeremy was named one of the Hollywood Reporter's top innovators. And as I mentioned, he lives in California with the wife, his wife, Samantha, and his four children. What are the names of your kids, Jeremy? My oldest is is Zion. Then um, I've got twins. Uh, Zion's eleven. Then I've got twins, uh, Emmett and Bo. Uh, they're nine, and Aria is four years old. Wow! You should have much nachas, my friend. That's oh, incredible. Wow. Just okay, I thank you for doing the interview. It looks like Jeremy's leaving. Hmm. I'm just kidding. By thank the way, you. I remember. I remember when you spoke at MGE. You came up with a bottle of water. Do you remember when you gave that talk at the MG dinner many, many years ago? I do. I remember giving the talk, but I, I don't, I don't remember the water, but I would, I drink a lot of water. <laughs> you consumed tons of water in that one speech. I was like, you know, so before we get started, just, um, you know, uh, I want to get one thing out of the way. Just tell us about the rabbi who performed your wedding. I, I hear it was unbelievable. I mean, it was, it was printed up in all the papers. People are still talking about it. Um, well, that rabbi was, 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 was pretty great. Um, and, and that rabbi was actually, uh, you, that rabbi had a lot of pressure because there were, I think we had seven, seven rabbis, uh, performing at our, 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 our wedding. So, um, so that rabbi really had to, had to perform and, and do fantastic. And, uh, I think, I think he stepped up. Uh, <laughs> All right, guys, that was me. I had the honor of marrying Jeremy and Sam. It was a beautiful, beautiful wedding. And Jill and I, by the way, Jill sends her love. Jill and I um, uh, still use your benchers, your handy dandy benchers that we gave you gave out. Oh, fantastic. First of all, how how, how are you doing? How's Jill? How's the mishpacha? The mishpacha is great. Thank God. My kids are good. Also for little different stages of life. My oldest is 23. That is so crazy. Well, we got married, I got married, what, like five, 12 years ago? Something well, like your, your oldest is 11, so I'm going to go with at least 12. 14, 14, I don't know. <laughs> you got married, dude. You married 15 years, no? 14 years? I Yeah, something like that. <laughs> something like that. My dad said, I'm going to mess this up. My dad told me he, um, that, that he and my mom have been happy for 20 years, and then they met each other. <laughs> 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 it's like a classic Jackie Mason line. Thank you, right? So, but... <laughs> So um, for those of us who don't know you, tell us a little about uh, your background, where you grew up. Um, did you want to be in film, writer, live in Los Angeles and be in this world of Hollywood? Was that, was that something you knew from a young age? Tell us a little about your background. Um, yeah, I grew up in Rockland County, New York, in New City, uh, not far from Muncie, uh, but, but very far from Muncie. Um, I didn't, yeah, I always loved making movies and making people, uh, making people laugh, but I never really thought it was something that, that you can do. Um, and then, so I'm so sorry. I wonder if there's a way that I can't, is there a way that I can't see me? 
because <laughs> I keep looking at myself talking and I'm so distracted by myself. Can you see? I mean, this is also probably as upsetting, but can you see me? I see you. I, I want to oh. like blow up your picture up so I can. I want to. Uh, so I think. I think if you just. By the way, this is so interesting, I'm sure, to all the listeners, um, <laughs> how to. Okay. You, can, you, you can just turn your camera off. You could just turn oh. your camera off. Okay, so that, stop cam. There yeah. we go. Much better. Yeah, but now I can't see him. Oh, man. Yeah, I think you should just push through the vulnerability. It's like you're on the screen now. You. Okay. This is you as the actor. But I see myself talking, which totally throws me off. So anyway, I'm going to try and focus. There we go. By the way, I find this fascinating that a writer, a successful Hollywood writer is having an issue seeing himself talking. I can't. I just want to like cover it up. I just want to do that so I can say so I can cover it up. There, there we go. That's, that's much you better. You did do some acting. I mean, you did do some acting, no? Uh, I did do some acting when I was in college. Um, and um, But it wasn't because I... I was good at it. It was more just because I, I wanted to make people laugh. And, um, and I also love to write and direct. And, and that was just an opportunity to, uh, that was just an opportunity to get involved in the theater department. Um, I was not, a, I was not a, a good actor at all. <laughs> um, so I went to college um, and I, after my, my first year of, of college, I didn't know, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I, you know, I didn't really know anyone in, in the industry. Um, I, I came back to Rockland County during that summer and I worked, um, I just, I worked in construction um, and got back to school. And when I got back to school as a sophomore, everyone was talking about what they did that summer. Um, and I had a friend who went to Egypt and did archeology span and um, someone did an internship in San Francisco, uh, doing designing gardens and and somebody you know went to washington and worked as a page or you know as an intern in 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 the uh the white house or in uh the the, the capitol building um and it was sort of that moment that it hit me that my options were bigger than what i had known and i started to think about things that i loved and i loved movies um so i s decided that i was gonna try and get an internship in Los Angeles and uh, reached out to pretty much everyone I knew to see if there was any connection. And I had a friend who went to high school who had an older sister who was an assistant um, to a writer on Saved by the Bell, the new class, which is not the original Saved by the Bell. And it's not the new Saved by the Bell. It was the middle Saved by the Bell. Um, so I reached out to her through my friend from high school. She had a friend who was an assistant to a producer who had a deal at Disney. And I was able to get an internship that coming summer, um, if I drove out to Los Angeles and found a place to stay. So I did. Um, and I, I worked for someone, um, a, a producer named Marty Katz, who, uh, taught me a, a ton and I worked in the Disney building. It was pretty amazing coming to work and seeing wow. the seven dwarfs, uh, up, wow. you know, in, in stone up there. And, um, it was great. I mean, the day I, the, the first day I got to work, I was handed a script and I was told just read the script and, and, and see what you think. And I opened it up and it was like interior police station day. So, and so on. And it was the first time I'd ever read a script. And I just was like, Oh, this is how a movie's written. Um, so I, um, so I just can started consuming scripts and I would make notes I would just make notes if there was first it would be like it would be grammar then it would be oh wait this doesn't really make sense this doesn't track because this person said this this time now they're saying this this person's name isn't right here then I would think of a joke and I would just kind of write the joke into the script that I was reading and I would just start doing this and it'd be oh wouldn't it be funny if this person did this and about halfway through that summer I was like oh maybe I can I can do this I can write a script um so I just started writing a script and um, that was when, that was when I realized, when, when I finished my first script, um, I realized it was something I could do, uh, which was, uh, which was, pro which was a problem. <laughs> and, and <laughs> I mean, I and that stuck with construction, uh, but. And, and that, and that, that um, I'm curious though, was it helpful that you were, I mean, you were an undergrad at Yale at the time when you did this. Right, you did this over the summer, 
or you did this as an internship and uh, as it was it helpful that i was at yale at the time yeah i mean it was is yale known for putting out great writers like well, filmmakers I, yeah i think that i mean there's a ton of um there's a ton of great writers and actors and producers who who went to yale um but i don't really think at the time i don't really think it, it helped me that much in in terms of the getting in um you know it helped in that when when you go to yale or a place like that people think you're smart so you can make up words or you could just say things that you know that that, that, that people believe um even if you don't know the answer um but no i mean the the following summer i i was it, the yale thing actually helped a lot because i um David Milch, who created NYPD Blue and Hill Street Blues mm -hmm. and Brooklyn South um, and Deadwood, uh, he went to Yale and he decided to take 12 Yale students and and fly them out to California and put put them up and um, and teach them and let let them work and them. I'm saying them because I was I was one of the I was one of them um, on that show called Brooklyn South. So that was the following summer that I, I did that with David Milch, who's who's an incredible guy. Um, then went back to to college and I, I knew what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to be in this business. I knew I um, I knew I could do something in this business. I didn't know what it was. And the advice that I was given was to go work at an agency. Uh, so I my senior year, I I I try to get intern. I try to get uh, interviews at all the big agencies, and I was able to get an interview at Creative Artists Agency (CAA). And I worked. Um, I started working at CAA when I. Uh, got out of when I graduated college. Wow! So you started. You started young. Yeah. You started young. And where were you at Jewishly at this time in your life? When I, I mean, Jewishly, I, I, I've been, I, I've, I've been kind of at the same sort of level from my entire life. Um, you know, with 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 varying observances, uh, you know, but you know, I always kept kosher. Um, I ate pizza out. I, I, but, but aside <laughs> from eating pizza out, um, always kept kosher. I never, I never had shrimp or pork or, or, or anything like that, or, or I never had any flesh out. Um, went to shul, I, I davened, um, did Shabbos dinner. Your family, your family raised you to be Shomer Shabbat. You're saying uh, it, we we weren't raised Shomer Shabbat. But we were raised very traditional, with very um, with very with our own rules, um, which we mm -hmm. kept. So we used on Shabbat, we would use a microwave, but not an oven, right? Um, Funny, I've heard that in a number of homes. Yeah, we would like I I we didn't. My mom wouldn't drive on Shabbat, but my my father would. So, mm -hmm. you know, I would, I would, I would go, I would drive with my father, but I never went out on Friday nights. Friday night was always Shabbat, um, but we would have Shabbat dinner uh, and then I, we would watch a movie or, or something along right. those lines. Um, and, you know, it's, I would say it's throughout my whole life, it's been some version of, of, of that and some version of, 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 of making kind of making the rules that, that work, um, and, and really trying hard, uh, to keep to those rules. And, and, and you taught me, I believe you taught me that, um, that, uh, the mezuzah is slanted because marriage is, uh, is not a compromise. It's a collaboration. <laughs> Um, and, and, uh, that's kind of, I kind of use that in, in all business and creative dealings as well as I don't like to compromise on anything creatively. I always like to collaborate on something too, because we're trying to make something better. I never want to feel like, oh, this is worse because of something, yeah. something suggesting I want to feel as if, okay, let's figure out we're seeing this in different ways. There's got to be something that we both love. So let's keep pushing until we find that thing. Yeah. Yeah. And was there a time when you started getting into things and more? I mean, I remember, and one of the things I'm always proud to say, um, I had, we had a Chavruta, you and I, we studied Torah together for quite a while. And I remember it was 8.30 in the morning, my time. 
which means it was 5.30 in the morning your time. Um, now, I, I assume that's not just because you're an early riser, but because you, you really wanted to incorporate more Judaism, more Torah into your life. When did that start taking place? Like, when did you start having, I guess, getting more committed or more, more serious? Well, I would, I, the bigger question, uh, um, just to turn it around is, is yeah. when did it stop? You know, when did that, you know, I, when did we last do those? Cause that would be something that it would be, be great to, to pick up again. And, and, uh, that would be amazing. I would be, I would love to do that. Um, uh, dude, um, I don't do anything. I just sit around and wait for Shabbos to come, you know, rabbis, <laughs> they fiddle their thumbs all week. Six more days till Shabbos. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, there was a, there was, I had my way of, 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 of living and the way I was raised and the choice that, 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 that I always made a big thing always was kashrut. Kashrut for me was, I, that was a big thing for me. Why I kept kosher. I didn't know. And when, um, the, so when, when Sam and I started dating, um, we kind of, we were making those, we were trying to make the decision of how we're going to, to, to raise our family. And um, Sam really was the one who said, okay, I'm happy to become kosher, but I want to learn what, why, why is it? And, and that's when um, we connected with, with Rabbi Ezra and, and you, and um, we started going down the, the, uh, the MJE path and, um, and, went to Israel and Sam did a little studying in Israel. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, I would say that was a, that was a pretty significant time. Um, that's such a by the way, if I could just jump in there, that's such a important, I love that. And I remember that about Sam, she didn't just want to do what she wanted to understand it. And of course, when you start digging a little deeper into your Jewish heritage, you find out, you know, a lot more than just like the area that you were digging into that was Kashrut, but it opens up a whole other world. You know, the studying and the understanding is just so key. Uh, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's important. So when do we, so 5.30 tomorrow, are we on? <laughs> Dude, I, I, I mean this sincerely. Um, I don't know how you do, do you still get up at those hours? I get up pretty early. Yeah. My <laughs> life is, my life right now is pretty insane but i would absolutely love to do a a, a once a month 5 30 it would be an incredible all right you know what we're doing this in front of the world here this is on facebook live this is should, on we the do, should we do it in front of the world the actual learning once a month yeah 5 30 in the morning once a month we will let the world we will we can publicly study torah together no but let's 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 re uh let's redo that it would be my honor it would be great i mean and, and honestly like a, a big thing when we were when we were getting married it was and this happens I, I believe with a lot of people a lot of couples a lot of families i know when you when you're getting married there's this um there's just this this beauty around the marriage and the preparing for the marriage that's 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 you know that is judaism and then as you're kind of as you're dealing with life and and things that are are are, are incredible challenges <sighs> there that sense of community can that sense of community can be challenged and i i think it's important to um to you know be very honest and 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 try to um just try to re-engage as much as possible without you know without dismissing things or without um i don't know i i i it, that's why i would love to to to, to yeah. admit once a month, five thirty. I think that would be a great. Sure, man. Let's do it. I. It would be an honor, and I. I applaud your, not only interest in learning again, but just recognizing that at different stages in life, we have to try something different. We have to try something else. You know, I've been. Uh, I've been at this since I was a kid, um, and I'm a lot older now. And what works, you know, what worked for me back then, is just not. You know, I have two boys. I have one son in college, one who just finished college, and like. I could see where they're at so spiritually. And I just remember when I was in my early 20s, what it was like to be observant and what I enjoyed studying and learning and how it's changed. And if it doesn't change, it just gets stale. And it's not, and you can't grow with it. And it's just not going to speak to who you are now at this stage of your life. So I think that's really, really important. Tell us a little how your Jewishness, though, 
um, has maybe back then or continues or how it's different in terms of the way the movies that you choose to work on in your writing and your filmmaking? How, how does your Judaism continue to impact or, or, or doesn't it or, or does it impact it differently today? Well, I think that, um, you know, my Judaism or the tradition, I, I come from, from I'm, I'm children of Holocaust survivor. My grandmother is a Holocaust survivor. Um, I am, I am my movie. So anything that I'm writing is coming from who, who I am. There's a, you know, there's always characters in there that come from my life. Um, I don't want to say who they, they are, but there are always people uh, who, who are, who, who are people I know who are very, who have a very Jewish perspective on things. Um, I, I think that my, you know, just how I live at, at all times um, is I'm almost always trying to make a joke or try to, to um, have a, a, a witty response or, or a smart response to what's being said uh, that feels a little bit like, inspired by or 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 sort of it's part of jewish tradition from you know going back to the talmud um where people just have to argue right and and i think that um arguing and conflict is the nature of of any drama so when you're writing a, a film or when i'm making a film um we always have one character who wants to go this way or one character who, you know and the other character who wants to go this way and that now we're sort of we're rooting for for this person to accomplish th that um, versus if you're just watching like this person do that, you're not, there's no, there's no drama. There's no conflict there. And I just feel like, like if we were just listening to, you know, um, to, to, to Hillel or, or to Rabbi Hillel um, mm -hmm. and the Talmud was just Rabbi Hillel, it wouldn't be that interesting. I don't know. No. Right. Cause you just have, I, I think the fun of, of learning Torah is that debate it's fun i think jews like to argue and jews like to debate and um and jews like to be right <laughs> um yeah jews like to be right and we'll figure out a way to make ourselves right and it's fun to watch two people who like to be right all the time well that's a, that's a great insight and, and you know also just we'll start some of our learning right here right now but it's through the debates of shammai and hillel you know you mentioned hillel that really, I think, truth emerges, because it's it's the clashing of two differing opinions, and each one really, you know, pushing the other to fine tune their position, that a, a deeper truth comes out. It's actually, I don't know, I, I wasn't really thinking of share, of asking you this, but you know, one of the I wrote a whole blog about the cancel culture we're in, and and I just think it's so um, unfortunately, I mean, it's just unfortunate the way things are going in our world today, was we're not getting a chance to hear an opposing view as much. Um, I, I've seen that some of many of my students there, I, I, I'm on Facebook a lot these days and just, you know, everybody's got their friends whose opinion they subscribe to. And, you know, you, you know about all the defriending that took place that went on during the campaign. <laughs> you know, you don't agree with me, so I just I don't want to hear that perspective, and it's just a shame, and it's it's really antithetical to what you were just saying about how much importance there is to the conflict. Actually, uh, and, and you were just saying because it's interesting, you know, it keeps us awake. But um, I'm saying something a little deeper, maybe that like you know, without it, we're not going to arrive at a deeper truth. I oh, mean, I think it's uh, yeah, you're 100 percent right. I I didn't see that blog, but I'm excited to read it. <laughs> it's called uh, regaining nuance in a cancel culture, but I'll I'll send it to you. Uh, let me ask you a question. Um, any attentions though that you've had over the years? Curious between your own values, your own personal Jewish values, and the projects that you've been working on. In terms of what you know, are there tensions between like wh where I would put something into a film that isn't necessarily sure? I mean, I think I've said, you know, I I've said this before that I, I think my my comedy and, and my films are not not a hundred percent kosher. They're they're kosher style, um, and they're yeah. not 
you know, I, I think I've sent you warnings not to watch uh, you, you and all the other rabbis who, who, who attended our, our wedding not to watch the movies that I, I work on. Um, but pretty much every rabbi, so I, they usually email me or, or they call me or people who are very religious. They'll say, hey, just so you know, I was on. A, it always starts with I was on a plane. <laughs> Me, the next to me was watching this right. film, right? And, and I kept I was, him to turn it off, but you know, <laughs> they, have, they have a camera. For, by the way, when you and I were learning years ago, and I said, "Hey, Jeremy, what are you working on now?" And you were like, "Rabbi, the film I'm working on, it's. I think it's going to be big, but I, I, I don't, I don't think I can recommend you go see it." <laughs> and that, I think that was the Hangover. But anyway. Yeah. yeah. Now, by the way, the Hangover, um, the Hangover came out. So the Hangover came out um, the same weekend. My, my, the same weekend as as Up came out. The Disney's Up, and my, I remember my my grandma, my Bubby. Um, she was so excited to to go see my movie. To, to, and and I said, please just take her to see Up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, you know what? I so so. Zev Alexander, do you know Zev? Zev Alexander. Uh, no. So Zev no. Alexander and I went to to Camp Ramah uh, with each other um, years ago, and he said something to me at a Shabbos at a Shabbos um, dinner one time that always stuck with me, and it was I think it was when reviews started coming out, and 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 he said who he's like who cares what you know the critics are are saying as long as you're you're as long as you are able to pay for dry cleaning and, and Shabbos dinner, um, <laughs> that you're, 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 you're good. Um, and you're having fun. Um, it was just something to think about. Um, and I don't know why I thought I, I, that Zev, I, that Zev, uh, was involved with MG at some point, but. Oh, but it doesn't matter. I think also putting Shabbos dinner and dry cleaning in the same sentence, just in terms of priorities of life, if you can afford those two things. Uh, by the way, I've been in sweatpants for <laughs> and, and t-shirts for for months now so well that's a good, that, that that's a good transition because i was going to ask you um how has covid impacted you jeremy and your work in film sorry yeah um covid has been um covid has been incredibly challenging in many ways um we've can we, we put a slight pause on our on our uh on our production of a movie called plan B that was supposed to shoot in, it was supposed to shoot in March. Um, and we pivoted to distribute, to making and distributing 3d masks, uh, 3d face shields. Uh, and we were able to distribute over, I think we, we, we distributed over 25,000, th- uh, face shields right away before the face shields were, were being manufactured by the giant companies, which was kind of amazing. Um, and wow. then we were able to pick up. We did. Uh, we we finished shooting on a film in the middle of COVID called "The Ultimate Playlist of Noise," which uh, comes out January fifteenth on Hulu. Oh I, wow! I, I Wait, what's, it called? what's it called? Tell everyone again. It's, it's called "The Ultimate Playlist of Noise." Um, mm-hmm. You could actually probably, yeah, you can you can you can watch the trailer. It's it's it's. I'm a writing movie. it down. I'm excited. Okay. It's a beautiful movie with. Um, with lots of Jewish themes in the mm-hmm. movie, even though it's there's no mention of any Judaism in it. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. It's a it's about a it's about a, a young boy, uh, he's 16 years old, who um, finds out that he has a tumor in his brain, and they're going to have to do surgery. And the result of the surgery will um, affect his hearing, so he's going to lose his he's going to be completely deaf after a month. And it's the journey that he goes on over the course of that month uh, to collect the sounds. He wants to collect sounds. Um, oh my god! The country to to collect. To, it's a beautiful, beautiful movie. Wow! How long? How long did you work on that for? I've been working on that for you know, from from the script stage probably three or three years. Um, wow. wow! And then we were able to shoot another film during uh, during during uh covid uh called plan b that will come out march i know that'll come out in march or april i think um and then um so on on a business level it's been it's been challenging but we've been pushing through um on a personal level uh, i have been with my family for the entire time which is the first time ever 
I think that I've been with my family for a year straight, uh, wow. which is, which is wow. incredibly rewarding. Uh, my just being able to, to, uh, just be with my kids and Sam and, um, all the time is, is just fantastic. I love it so much. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. but now, but so we're, we're here, we've been, we, we came to Syracuse for the, the film for the summer when COVID hit and we're kind of, we're, we're, we're trying to figure out how to get back to Los Angeles. So we're, we right. keep starting and stopping. Um, but we're here for now and, um, we're incredibly, um, we're incredibly grateful that, that everyone's healthy and, um, and yeah, we're counting our, our we're counting our, 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 our blessings despite uh, all the challenges that. The well, that's that's really I'm so the I'm, I'm happy you kept your video on because the look on your face when you were talking about the extra stop, the time that you've been able to be with your family was just precious, really. Um, I mean, the kids are in they're they're zooming school. What are, what are they doing? Uh, they're they're um, Zion zooming to Los Angeles. Um, and uh, Bo and and, and Emmett are, are at uh, they're in person at um, at the the Syracuse Hebrew Day School. Oh wow! Well, oh, that's great. That's really really great. Yeah, it's 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 incredible. They've been they've been amazing. Oh, that's amazing. Well, um, and so th that's what you're working on now, I assume. In other words, the ultimate playlist of noise is done. Plan B is come. Is Plan B done as well? Plan B is finished um, shooting. Um, and that will, we're just in editing process of that right now. So that, that will come, I'm, I'm, we're in the post-production process and we're hoping to start a new movie, uh, any day now. Oh, I'm not allowed to say what specifically it's called. Um, cause it hasn't been announced yet. And, uh, working on a bunch of other things, always trying to, you know, we, we, we started this company called American high, um, about three years ago, which is mm -hmm. why kind of in Syracuse in Syracuse I uh, bought a high school an old abandoned high school and um, turned it into a film studio to shoot high school movies that take place in high school so over the past three years we've made eight we're about to start our ninth movie whoa so that's sort of that's why I've been traveling back and forth between Los Angeles and Syracuse and my life has, has been it's been pretty nuts. Um, and this was a, a welcome slowdown for it. And, and the, the ultimate playlist of noise that was also filmed in the high school in Syracuse. Yeah, everything we've, everything. Everything we've done is, is filming in Syracuse. In wow. Place. That is such a, it's such a creative idea to take over a high school and turn it into a film studio. I mean, you, you, were, were you nervous? You were putting a, a lot of eggs in, in the high school basket. Um, I wasn't nervous. I really wasn't nervous. I, I thank God I had a, a lot of support. Uh, I had a lot of support from family and, and Sam and, um, and I felt pretty confident that, that we were going to do something pretty special. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's been three years and we've been, we've been doing, we've been doing really well so far. We've made some really okay great movies and that are um you could catch them on netflix and hulu and um well tell us give us some other names give us some of you we did a movie called big time adolescence with pete davidson came out that was on who that was a big sundance movie um that you could watch they're all um it was in just named in the top five comedies of the, the year uh i did a movie called the binge with vince vaughn um oh, that people know right mm -hmm. I, I, I did a movie called banana split uh, looks that kill um and all these were done all these were done here in syracuse yeah all, all done here wait so hold on a second. You, go to, so, you can go to if actually if you literally if you go to um americanhigh.com you can americanhigh.com or just follow at american high on instagram you could see all the movies we've done all the trailers we've done things we're looking to do this is incredible so just to for our viewers you got the binge been in a split Looks that kill. What else? What are some of the others? Big time adolescence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Holly slept over. Mm -hmm. um, plan B. Uh, looks that kill. How right. Many did I so Wait, I got three, four, five, six, seven, and then the ultimate playlist of noise is eight. That's impressive, yeah, that's man. One we're starting soon. That's a lot of. That's a lot of movies. You've been, you've been busy. 
been really busy, been really busy. Um, the last few years have been really busy, which is why 5.30 works. <laughs> works. Tell us, let me answer your question just while we're on this, because I just taught a class last night on discipline. Um, and what advice would you give to people, particularly during COVID? Um, someone who's able to to knock out eight films. I mean, that's really impressive. Call a vote to you, Jeremy. What what is, what is you have any tips for people to stay? Uh, and I'll I'll tell you, I'm asking very personally. I just signed two book deals with two different Jewish publishers. I'm uh, writing. Awesome. Thank you so much. I wrote I wrote one a couple of years ago, and I'm writing two more now. And to be able to juggle MGE and my teaching and my students and my fundraising and running the whole staff plus writing two books, you know, you need a lot of dis any, any quick advice. Um, what works for you? Around what I do is I, I'm surrounded by amazing people who, if I'm falling off the discipline wagon, they're able to pick me up and there's checks and balances and it's okay to, it's okay to, to, I, I think it's okay to be, undisciplined every once in a while. Um, but I really, I, I have people who, who, who are, um, who are incredible. Um, I have partners and, 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 and just an amazing team and people who, um, just surround yourself with people who, who are great and, and it makes your life, um, I'm not going to say easy, but it makes your life, it makes it easier to be, to be. Yeah. Disciplined. It's also I'm easy not- when you're responsible for a lot of, people and a lot of people's uh a lot of people's um you know their their livelihood and their it's all i mean that's definitely something that i never really considered when i when i first started this company it was very exciting to to start something from from nothing and um and but i didn't you know what i didn't really anticipate were people quitting their jobs elsewhere and coming and working with us and, you know, people coming and saying, Oh, I could start a family. Oh, just so you know, like, thanks for everything. I'm able to start a family. And like, I could, you know, now my wife's like, we're going to have a baby. And suddenly I'm like, don't put that pressure on me. It's, <laughs> not a baby, not a baby. it's a lot of pressure when, you know, when people, you know, when people are depending on you for, for work. Um, and, and, and when you have the ability to, when you have the ability to help to help somebody in a way that could change their lives, it's hard not to, you know, it's hard to kind of live with that. It's hard to live with that. Um, it's hard for me to live with that thing that, you know, I'm not great at saying no to people. Mm-hmm. Um, and it gets overwhelming it gets overwhelming because um, it just gets overwhelming at times and, mm-hmm. and it, it makes it, it makes it challenging and there's a lot of pressure. Um, but that pressure also helps keep me disciplined as well. So yeah. the pressure on one hand is motivating you to, to keep working because there are other people depending on you. On the other hand, it could freak you out a little. Like uh, somebody comes over and says, now we can have that child we've always wanted. Yeah. <laughs> that's a challenging, that's really, really challenging you know where it's it's you have a community um where you have a community here which in in upstate new york where there really were there really wasn't any film industry up here and then we started this film industry and suddenly there's people moving here there's people with like looking for there are people who are who who we trained who were great who, who um who are here and they're working and they depend on us bringing these movies here in order to, to, to just to survive. And that just, it's hard for me to, you know, it's hard for me to kind of take time off knowing that information. Um, yeah. So that's the kind of thing I wish, like, I, I wish there was an, you know, I wish I wasn't, I, it's, it's, it's all good. I'm very, I'm, I'm very, uh, I'm very well, grateful. Thankfully, listen, thankfully it worked out. You know, the, the other thing you mentioned about surrounding yourself with amazing people, you got some checks and balances. You know, your good friend, Rabbi Ezra, who I'm sure is watching this now, give him a shout out. Um, you know, you know, he's our COO now. He's not just running MGE downtown, but he's running the whole operation. And we have these weekly meetings, the two of us, to go through endless amounts of 
programmatic details to make sure everything is happening. And once in a while, he'll just turn to me and he goes, I got this, get off the phone and get back to writing. <laughs> because, uh, you know, it's sometimes when the creative juices aren't flowing, it's easier sometimes to fress over little details of things that you know somebody else can do, but it's it's easier sometimes. You know, how do you keep yourself creatively juiced? You know, you wake up and just because you gave yourself 5.30 in the morning and you when you close the door, I remember you used to work in your garage, I think. And like, that doesn't mean you can just turn a, a switch on and all of a sudden out comes the, uh, the product. It's, it's really, it is really, it's, it's very hard. Um, because I've done, because I started this company, I'm not only just doing the creative stuff. I am doing management in, 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 in business, a lot of business stuff. Um, it is much easier to, as you, as you know, and you just kind of, it's much easier to kind of look through Excel spreadsheets and, you know, or do some organizing of things than to, um, to sit and stare at a blank page and, and write 20 pages of stuff a day. It's much easier to do that stuff. And, and sometimes it, it actually, you know, sometimes it actually helps to do that stuff just mm -hmm, to kind mm -hmm. of get, you know, and, and sometimes, sometimes it's just a, a procrastination and whatnot. Um, but it's hard the, the creative juices are also really challenging because it's hard for me. It's really hard for me to shut down ever. Um, it's hard for me to listen to any podcast or read any book or, or, or watch any show or do anything really without suddenly like thinking of something and saying, Oh, this is a great idea. Blah, blah, blah. I'm going to write it down. Right. You do something. I could do something with this. Or what if we did this is a really, it's, it's, it's a really, my breath. Like I can never, ever shut my brain down. I used to be able to do it by playing sports. I used to love mm -hmm. playing sports and. Oh yeah. I remember that. And I just can't play the sport. I can't play the sports that shut my brain down anymore. Um, I just have to walk and ride bikes and stuff like that. But that doesn't, you know, I'm still thinking. Um, but is that so bad? Let me ask a question. Is that, you know, as long as you can continue to spend quality time with your family, you can learn Torah, you can pray, you can do what you need to do as a Jew. You know, is it so bad that when you're spending time, you're with Sam or you're having a conversation with a friend, you're like, that's it. That's a great idea. That that here, that's a great tagline I can use for this. You know, is is that or or do you feel that somehow it's really impinging on your I, I think it's a blessing and a curse. I mean, the blessing is that I have endless amounts of of ideas. Um, I think the curse is that uh sometimes I I am not present. I mean, I'm often not present in the situation that I'm in. Um, because of you know you might say something and suddenly my mind goes off to oh uh, what if blah 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 it, you know um yeah yeah and i don't by the way i don't i don't i don't think there's a solution to that i think that's just how certain minds i think that's you know you you can't just expect the creative juices to flow between the hours of you know nine and five when you're in that room and you know it just doesn't work that way you know um and by the way, you're you're in the company of some really great, you know, um, sometimes the biggest chidushim. You know that term, a chidush is like a great Torah insight. Sometimes the chidushim, you know, just emerge at the most unlikely of times. You know, somebody's on a walk. I don't know. I have a weird thing. I love, um, it's going to sound ridiculous. I'm sitting right now on a pad. My back sometimes goes out, you know, and I got into like... Um, just either stretching, um, I don't do the yoga I should, but like, oh my God, sitting in a jacuzzi for me is just like with a beer and just ch chilling out. And I sometimes I had my greatest thoughts in the jacuzzi. I'm, you know, got a bathing suit on or something. It's okay. <laughs> but like, you know, and I don't know, just, you know, you're in a little more of a relaxed state. You're not expected to come up with something. It's very hard when, when you expect yourself to come up with something because that's the time you allotted for yourself. Right. So, and, and by the way, maybe that's why looking at Excel spreadsheets and, and organizing things, you know, someone else can be doing helps because it takes a little pressure off. It's like, you're not putting all of your eggs in your creative basket. I don't know. Yeah. And um, the jacuzzi thing sounds fantastic. Um, hopefully we could get back to LA at some point soon and I could, I could sit in our, my jacuzzi. 
jacuzzi and uh um, or we can post COVID, we can jacuzzi and learn. How's that as a, as a, we would have to be somewhat clothed, which is, which is probably appropriate anyway, but yeah, we can do that. Totally. You know, they, uh, the Talmud is replete with, uh, discussions of some of these great sages who were in the Beit HaMerchatz, which was the bathhouse. Now you're technically not supposed to speak Torah in a Beit HaMerchatz, in a bathhouse. That's why I don't know if you've ever been to a mikvah before Shabbat. Yes. I, I once wished somebody a good Shabbos and they said, nope, not in the mikvah. Because the word Shabbat, but you could say good Shabbos, but you can't say Shabbat Shalom because Shalom is one of God's names. And you're not permitted to utter God's name in, in a bathhouse. Just a little important uh, factoid for you. So my name is Shalom. And um, so how do they call how do they call me to, to jump in? Uh, Bob, probably something like that. Um, <laughs> Rabbi, I gotta, I gotta jump. Um, sure. This I'm is go. your, time, kids. your time is up, my friend. This is perfect. I want to thank you, Jeremy, for, for, for doing this. This was really, really great. Uh, it was so nice schmoozing and bleed that there without taking a vow. At least the jacuzzi, the jacuzzi, schmooze, schmooze, some version of. Oh, that that could be, that could be another name for the podcast, actually. Jacuzzi, schmooze, schmooze, schmooze. I don't know. I, well, I'll keep thinking on it. But let's let's do the learning, and I want to thank you for um, for giving us your time. One last quick thing: somebody said that you had some kind of role in Dumb and Dumber, and I was just watching. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Did you? Did you I, was the, I was the inspiration for Dumb and Dumber. No, I it was Dumb and Dumber too. I, I just um, I did a a a, a I did every, on on a bunch of the comedies. They do roundtables, and they bring yeah. in comedy yeah. directors, and you basically sit around the room, and um, you 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 do jokes and then you 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 follow up and you do i did a little bit of work on on that but so did 30 other writers and um just and keep to keep plugging that all these other eight little films that you made just dumb and dumber man that's what it's about uh, no it was the second one dumb and dumber two two two, two. okay yeah, yeah no i i have nothing to do with dumb and dumber one other than i've probably burnt out uh, a vhs uh tape <laughs> watching it over and over and over again and i actually showed and, and i hope my wife isn't watching but i've actually showed watched it with my my kids and it's oh uh, god you've corrupted them as well that's perfect yeah. <laughs> well go ahead jeremy thank you so much for your time please send my love to samantha and just good things and i look forward to our learning all right thank you take care everyone so guys you're not, you're not a yet. right you're yeah. not a mitra, right i was gonna say shabbat shalom but <laughs> Shabbat Shalom. It's a little early in the week, but and we're not in the mikvah, so you can say it. Sure. No Take care, my friend. Thanks so much. And guys, uh, thank you. If I'm still on Facebook Live, I just want to thank everyone for tuning in to hear about my conversation with uh, Jeremy. As you can see, we're all friends. He's such a wonderful, amazing guy. And um, thank you for tuning in. And I just want to announce also every day this week, we'll be having uh, the Lunch and Learn program. And um, tomorrow we've got Dr. Dina Berkowitz. I'm back on, um, uh, actually, Dr. Dina's Thursday, and I'm on Friday. And I want to mention next week's podcast is going to be at 1130. Next week's Lunch and Learn is going to be moved from 1230 to 1130. And we've got the unbelievable opportunity to hear from a great, uh, extremely learned entrepreneur, uh, his name is Rabbi David Lichtenstein, and he has one of the most successful podcasts called Headlines. He's an author, he's a writer, he's a brilliant Torah scholar, and he's also really out there in the social media world. And he happens to be an extraordinarily successful uh, real estate developer, um, and we're going to be talking to him. Check him out. David Lichtenstein is an extraordinarily modest individual, but amazingly accomplished. I got to know him during the COVID period, actually. So I'm going to be having the opportunity to interview him next week at Tuesday, but not the same time. It'll be at 1130. Uh, we'll put it on Facebook Live and also on the podcast, David Lichtenstein. Thank you all for tuning in, and uh, thanks for the help again, Scott. All the best. Have a great day, everyone.